we are here to talk about Urdu, the language, its struggles, its literature, and uh, how it has made its way, um, survived in the last few decades. We'll sort of uh, try and talk about, in the beginning, um, talk a little bit about what our own relationship with Urdu is like. I grew up uh, not knowing any Urdu at all. Um, my grandfather was an Urdu writer, but I didn't study it in school and I was not taught it at all. My mother also did not really know how to read and write Urdu. She knew just enough to write letters to her mother because her mother uh, didn't know any English. Uh, but for all other purposes, she knew only more or less English, a little bit of Hindi and um, she didn't teach us anything, not even the alphabet. When I was very little, my grandfather once tried to teach me the alphabet but I was not interested in learning at that time. And nobody kind of said, no, you must learn. So I just grew up completely without it. I was very interested in poetry though. Um, and I heard some songs and lyrics and, uh, which kept me sort of interested. And when I was about in my teens, my grandfather was still alive at the time. So my mother started to send him his poems written in Devnagri, in the Hindi script which she would send letters to him with all the, at that time we didn't have online dictionary, there was no internet and we didn't even have an Urdu to English dictionary. So she would write back to him with all the hard words underlined and he would write letters back explaining the meanings of those words and my mom would read them out to me, that's how. I sort of maintained a little bit of a connection. Last year, it was, I made a New Year's resolution that I will learn Urdu. And I'm happy to report I've at least mastered the alphabet. Uh, there you go. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> so, um, my own relationship with Urdu is very tenuous. However, in the last few years, with the coming of the internet, many things have changed. A lot of the literature is now accessible to us in Roman English. And um, also apart from that, I also discovered that a lot of the literature, especially poetry, is available in Hindi script, which I read quite fluently. So that has been my relationship with it. However, I understand that it's a sort of limited relationship with many limitations. I would like to invite uh, Asad and then Rakshanda to also describe what their relationship with Urdu has been like. Thank you, Ali. Unlike any or Rakshanda who are insiders to the language, if not the written one, it is the popular one or the spoken one and the Urdu culture. I came from outside. Urdu is not my first or second or even third language, which are Bengali, Assamese and Hindi in that order. And then I came into Urdu when I came to study at Al Muslim University and heard this beautiful language spoken around the humor and the wit and the poetry of it and I was immediately seduced by it and realized that much of the fun of living there would be lost if I don't learn the language. That was the beginning and later in a couple of years I will start translating from it because I have read authors who are so mesmerizing like Isma Chukdai and Manto. They were so interesting that I felt the irresistible urge to communicate my excitement of reading them through translation into English to reach a wider audience. And then I got into it and I familiarized myself with the back history because in the 80s, that was the time, the atmosphere of Urdu, Urdu leadership, Urdu publication was rather grim. Urdu was steadily disappearing as a language of wide circulation 
I would see that my hostel fellows, they will write back to their home. The language would be Urdu, but uh, the script will be in their family because they have not studied it uh, in the school. So also I uh, wonder whether a language will survive without a script. I would also like to recreate that history after partition when the language was thought to be in real danger and Urdu writers would go around the country mobilizing support and uh, compiling signatures to have the Urdu language as the second state language of Uttar Pradesh and Bihar and so on. But the fact remained that there was no opportunity perhaps or as good opportunity to learn it in the schools and Urdu was progressively disfeeling from employment purposes the employment opportunity, opportunities shrunk now if we don't have employment opportunities linked to a language it becomes very difficult for that language to prosper you found gradually that Urdu periodicals and newspapers, periodicals particularly, that were very popular and had wide circulation. Their circulation was shrinking and ultimately they were folding up. Academically, there were several points and I'll, I'll uh, touch on one or two points which to my mind as an outsider were helpful in providing an entry to the young readers to the language. One was, translation was gaining prominence in the 80s and 90s and translation studies as a discipline was being taught, was begun to be taught in schools and universities and even students in English department or cultural studies department they begin to study Indian writers from different languages translated into English. Gradually you found that Isma Chaktai was a popular choice for gender studies, for women writing. And a couple of years later when India, uh, when it was 50 years of India's independence, we talked a lot about India's partition, Mantu became the rage and Mantu's works were translated, he became popular. Now the question is whether some readers, after reading the translation, they feel curious enough to come back to the language. In my mind they do. I have seen from my personal experience that you get so fascinated by reading a writer in translation that if possible you like, like to explore the writer in the original language. That has been so far my personal trajectory. I got so interested in the writers that I explored the language and I now know the script and the language a little. much a living language. Um, everybody in the family knew English and used English for various purposes but English as it was stopped at the doorstep and once you were in the home and within the family people spoke in Urdu. So in real terms it was my effective first language, it was my mother tongue. Um, also and the wit and humor and the shayari that Asad referred to was pretty much in the air around me. So I accessed Urdu through its culture initially. Uh, if somebody had to say something uh, within the family, they would resort very easily, very naturally, very organically to a snatch of poetry, to a fragment of verse. It came. Somebody is peeping through uh, from the door, they'd say, Saab chupte bhi nahi, saab ne aate bhi nahi. You know, that kind of thing. So it came naturally. People didn't have to think 
very hard and because the parents and the extended family were doing it, so would we. Uh, living in Delhi but going to Aligarh for summer vacations meant we did something which is an Urdu version of an Atakshani, which is a pet Pazi. Immediately the family and Uttar Pradesh has long, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, what are they called, power failures, power cuts. So on long, sultry, dark summer afternoons and evenings, we would be doing pet Pazi where uh, you would say one verse and where it ended, just like in Antakshini, from the alphabet where it ended, the other party had to immediately respond with the words. So instead of film songs, you had Urdu poetry, which was being tossed back and forth. You had to be really quick because you know you have to be, you have to think. So for that, you had to memorize. And so as children, it was a bit of a competition to remember all of this and cram all of this into your summer vacations. You came back to Delhi, and it was back to your English medium schools and all the rest of it. So there was a dual life one was living with Urdu very much in the home and English being used for work and for months outside. Uh, as I was telling my panelists earlier that I was fortunate to go to a school which actually implemented a, a law that exists, a law that was made which is called the three language formula. Schools are required to introduce children to a third language. The default option in most schools, I don't know what it's like here, but I know that up north in Delhi, the default option is Sanskrit. So willy-nilly, a child from 6, 7, 8, apart from English and Hindi, ends up studying Sanskrit. Uh, but there are exceptions to this, and there are schools such as the one I went to, which offered you a whole host of languages, French and Italian and Punjabi and this and that, and all that. So one learned the script, and that came in very handy. Um, like I said, my introduction was through culture, through the 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 the, the share of shairi, the tanzo mazar, the wit, humor, satire. That is such a is such a rich pickings in Urdu. Uh, but because I could read, and of course uh, in Urdu you make mistakes of hawa and bua, which I would do quite late in life. So I, I would read very fortunately. But with practice, that kind of uh, uh, began to improve. Very late in life, in my 40s, I decided to do a PhD. And all the scattered reading I had been doing over 20 odd years, bits and pieces of Manto, bits and pieces of this, that, the other, came in very handy. Uh, but I had no critical idiom in Urdu. For me, Urdu was a gharelu zaman, a domestic language. I didn't know how to frame an argument to, to uh, I had read no, uh, no Urdu criticism, for example. So, that was a learning that started very late in life in my early 40s when I actually began to read Urdu criticism and began to understand whether, how it intersected with Western theories and so on. So that was a learning and that came late to me but I'm glad I, I, I did that structured reading at that point when I had already dipped a very sort of, uh, what shall I say, in a very eclectic manner in different kinds of Urdu in a haphazard but as it turned out, eclectic manner. I actually have to say that I owe a debt of gratitude to both Rakshanda and Asal because a lot of literature that I had not read and I still haven't read in the original has been made possible only because of translation. Um, whether it is Isma Chaktai, Manto, and Hussain, the new reading that I'm doing, and both of these people continue to, to um, uh, make a lot of efforts towards translating writers who are not so popular yet in English, uh, but making their works available in English. Um, I also have to share this with you that a lot of my, and the way I think all of you also receive Urdu, is actually through Hindi films. Um, the only thing is we are not conscious that this is Urdu. Um, I just wrote an article recently about uh, how. Uh, People are now making people conscious of the Urdu that is all around you, in the air, only you don't think of it as Urdu. In our mind, Urdu is a Purani film, mein somebody is in a black Sherwani and singing some old song and a lot of people are crying and that feels like Urdu, but that isn't really Urdu. Urdu is a completely different ecosystem. So there is this young man called Nasheed Chadani, he started a Facebook thing called Ish Urdu. Um, and he put, puts up these very cool uh, gifs and memes and, and, and does this 
whole thing called Bollywood without Urdu. So he just replaces the Urdu word with the more Sanskritized Hindi word to make you aware of what actually things look like. For example, Mogambo Khushwa. You think it's Hindi, but if you just remove Khush with the more Sanskritized word, it's Prasan. And so then it would have been Prasan yeah, while you know it it works but it doesn't work the way we have kind of grown up with it etc so i think that a lot of what young people now are doing are kind of waking up to urdu and also reclaiming it as a language of fun as a language of currency not as that old boring thing making it their own um, i would like to invite asad and rakshanda again to kind of share about how they think urdu is changing like, is it changing as a language of literature and words? Well, from my personal experience, I can say that uh, about a year ago, I received a mail from a gentleman in Virginia, USA, saying that he has written a collection of poetry in Urdu, but in Roman script, and he wanted to share with me whatever he has written and then he came over to Delhi and shared with me and then I asked him how did you learn the language he said that all this was through the internet and could you find someone to transfer this script from the Roman into Nastale Urdu so that I can publish it so this is indicative of the enormous possibilities now of the uh, internet space or cyberspace <coughs> but perhaps the cyberspace Rakshanda perhaps will talk about it, she knows best but for me the concern is that will all that translate into really increasing the readership in the language itself because as far as print culture is concerned, the prospects are not too hopeful. We do not have appreciable number of print runs of copies of publication of, let us say, novels. Luckily, poetry is still popular. There is a currency to do poetry. And even if a number of volumes are not sold in India, Poets, they carry their volumes when they go to the Middle Eastern countries or European countries. And I suppose they sell appreciable number of copies to sustain themselves. But by and large, as far as fiction is concerned, we find that, uh, my experience is that uh, a large number of the books are self-published or after taking subsidy from some source or the other, Urdu Academy and so on. The question is, unless you have a sizable number of readership, wide readership to sustain the print culture, it is very difficult to produce book, books and uh, to keep the culture of reading going. So that is my concern. Urdu has a plan B and a very effective plan B, which is that it's available, large amounts of Urdu prose and certainly poetry is available in Hindi. Uh, and that has done enormous damage to those who are daunted by the script. I don't see why they are daunted because scripts have, I mean, people do read Chinese and, and Japanese in their scripts. So why this hesitancy to learn the Urdu script, I've not been able to understand. Having said that, because the script is seen by many people as an obstacle and so there is an effective option which is that large parts of it are available in Devnagri and people seem to think that this is a good way of accessing it. The fact that there is interest in Urdu, there seems to be no doubt at least in my mind. And I say this because since 2002 I've been running this small organization called Hindustani Awaz which works almost entirely through programming, through content driven programming which means my own uh, experience or my own entry into Urdu was through, uh, through its cultural component and my sense is that that is of interest to large numbers of people. 
so whether it is Shero Shairi, Ghazal Gaiki, uh, uh, Beit Mazdi, uh, Drame, a whole lot of things, film songs, all of those options give you an entry into the language. So there is the oral component of Urdu for which you don't need to know Urdu and uh, you have politicians, you have people reciting Urdu in, 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 uh, in public forum, even the Honorable Prime Minister resorted to a share by Rida Fazli when he had to get the opposition to come and join hands. Any number of examples of people who do not have really a context or a background in Urdu, but nevertheless they use Urdu to make a point. When the astronaut, or astronaut who went to Rakesh Sharma, when Indira Gandhi asked him, from outer space. Back comes the answer, So there is an access, there is a there is a you know easy access into Urdu and people resort to it very happily, very naturally. That is the oral component. The written, I, I find that Hindi publishers have done a lot of uh, well good for Urdu but harm for its script. I don't think they intend to do any harm, but the fact is that it is available in Devanagari. Large numbers of matto are available to you in in um, in in in, in Hindi. Fez, Ipal, Ghalib, everything that you might want to read. But but having said that, you know, script is such a tricky business. I think uh, whenever we talk about Urdu, we end up talking about script. Devanagari gives you an a, a, it can only show that much to you. Everything cannot be possible. The Hindi script is not was not designed to carry certain sounds. You can put a bindu on a, on a ka and turn it into a kaf, but there is only so much weight that those alphabets can take. My suggestion is those who are keen to learn Urdu should not have this parhez, should not have this distancing from the script. And it, 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 there are no easy answers to this whole Urdu Hindi debate and this whole business of script. While Hindi does open up windows, I think somewhere it also shrivels Urdu's reach. Um, it's very interesting. Um, I was reminded of how Adha Gaon, this is a very, uh, uh, by Rai Masum Rasa, it's a very popular novel. It has been translated into English also as A Village Divided. It's a partition novel. It's, the, it's set in the time of partition. And towards the end, there's this sort of scene in the novel where, you know, um, people typically have been um, singing nahas and things and, and the notebooks that the girls of the family you know, maintain were written in Urdu and towards the end, this, it's still the same song, it's still the same um, people were singing it, but they start writing it in Devanagari. And um, I think Rahim Asum Raza was a big advocate of just shifting the language of Urdu to Hindi to just say let's just give up this uh, the the sort of uh, Nastaric script and let's just move to the Dante. I don't know. There are possibly good and bad things in both. My question is just a curiosity. It means uh, you uh, you talked about how Urdu is moving into cyberspace and contemporary, and in some way it brings back the orality and something which print probably could not capture at some time. So. This, these are the new possibilities of digital platform. So, uh, however, my question is, uh, Urdu has moved into cyberspace and the newer domains. Have, uh, how does Urdu lexicon, has it changed in the sense that has it been hybridized? Has it started accepting uh, words from English or even technology or whatever? For example, what happens to Marathi in Mumbai? Uh, ha has some, some similar developments been seen in the uh, Urdu as it is spoken? And more interestingly, it could be if it is as it is written. It's, is it written in today's language? Uh, is there something like contemporary Urdu in which there is some literature? So it's just a curiosity that. Uh, you know, purely from the literary point of view, um, the can I mean, as you know, the canon changes. So let's say a hundred years ago, we had people like Hali, who were, and this is 1900, turn of the century, they were bringing in English words into Urdu. Sar Sayyad was doing it, who was writing in, uh, in, in Urdu, but he was bringing in English words. Hali was using words like nature, natural, and almost in a way, normal. These were almost being used. And uh, 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 a short story writers, fiction.
fiction writers were using a lot of boreat coming from the word bore hona. Most people think boreat, it's a coinage, but it, its root is bore. So they don't say boredom, they say boreat. And this you will find in both Bolchar ki Urdu and in fiction. So the, the canon is evolving, the vocabulary is evolving, and if you look at contemporary writing, you look at Zakia Mashadi, a writer from Patna, you look at uh, Khalid Javed, you look at all of you, Khalid Javed is contemporary at Jamia, a very fine modernist uh, fiction writer. They are not writing a dense language at all. They are writing an accessible language, a language that allows you entry, which is not masnuhi, which is not cosmetic. You see? So, uh, if you were to look at contemporary uh, English writing, right? Gulzar uses a lot of English words in his uh, short stories. You know? So, it's not just English, it is the use of Urdu also, which I see changing. If you look at contemporary fiction, uh, it would be very different from, let's say, Zakia Mashadi's uh, the stories uh, would be very different from Isma's. Because language is changing. And I think writers are uh, uh, conscious of that. They are using language in a, in a more, uh, as, as a living language. I'd just like to add a little bit to that. I think, you know, uh, I'm very interested in where words come from. So when I was little, my grandmother, because she didn't speak English for her training and everything was just in Urdu, she used to call, um, she used to say bakas, like trunk. The word for trunk in Urdu was bakas. And I kept thinking, ye bakas kaha se aaya? Bakas comes from box, right? Um, and baksa, even baksa, box. Bakas, it becomes, and like bread, we don't have bread, or what you call bread, so they call it double roti. So it keeps changing, you know, when bread comes, then you look at it and you think, Acha roti to hai, but roti nahi hai, so double roti. Um, these, these evolutions have been happening over the last century, they continue to happen. Even now, online to bahut maza ho hai, because English is colliding with Urdu in a very sharp way now. So young people are using this mix of what we call English, it's happening in Urdu also, and it's bound to happen.